This podcast is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute professional medical advice. The information presented on this podcast are my own personal views, opinions, and summaries of research. Always consult your physician regarding any medical concerns, conditions, or treatments. everyone. Welcome back for episode three of It's Not You, It's Me, a podcast about PMDD. First off, I would like to thank those of you that have reached out to me on Twitter and have followed me. It means so much to me to have these interactions with you all. And thank you for taking the time to give my podcast a listen. I very much appreciate the support and hope this is something that continue to grow. So I wanted to take a minute and thank you all for the support that I have received so far. As I mentioned in the last episode, I wanted to spend some time diving into the various treatments for PMDD. If you have tried any of these treatments or a combination of these treatments, I would love to hear about your experience and whether or not it worked for you. You can send me a voice message using the Anchor app, which is free to use, and I can maybe use that snippet in a future podcast. Or you can send me a message on Twitter at PMDD Podcast to let me know your thoughts, your experiences and just kind of, you know, what you've been through. So let's start with lifestyle and diet changes, which seems to me um, the obvious treatment recommendation is probably one of the first ones. It's said that exercise can help relieve the symptoms of PMS, but also possibly the symptoms of PMDD. Because as you know, PMS and PMDD are very similar, but they're also different. Uh, It doesn't seem like there's been enough studies on exercise helping with PMDD, But personally, I think exercise should be a go-to treatment for just about anything, just because of all the health benefits you can reap from it. And like Reese Witherspoon explained to us in Legally Blonde, exercise gives you endorphins. Endorphins make you happy. So, you know, there's that expertise. (laughs) Um, Aerobic exercises like jogging, swimming, and biking tend to boost energy levels and improve mood along with a slew of other benefits, like lowering your cholesterol and blood pressure, reducing stress, you know, all that good stuff. In regards to diet, I was looking over an online article from Harvard Medical School from 2009 that said the typical dietary advice given to women looking to relieve symptoms of PMS are unlikely to help those experiencing symptoms of PMDD. At that time, there was some evidence suggesting that eating more high-protein foods or complex carbs like steel-cut oats, sweet potatoes, and black beans would help raise tryptophan levels. Tryptophan, yes. What we joke about during Thanksgiving is causing our naps after that big meal is a precursor to serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that has many functions like regulating mood and social behaviors, appetite, sleep, and memory. Since women with PMDD have serotonin abnormalities during the late luteal phase, The idea is that tryptophan supplements can help boost those serotonin levels during that time. Interestingly, tryptophan supplements are also a recommendation in battling chronic migraines. Since my boyfriend suffers from chronic migraines and I have PMDD, I ordered us a bottle of tryptophan pills from Amazon the other day to test whether it actually makes a difference. Um, Since serotonin levels seem to be only out of whack during the late luteal phase, otherwise known as my PMDD weeks. Um, I've been debating whether to try taking that supplement solely during those weeks versus taking them every day. Um, Maybe I can just start with the PMDD weeks and see how it goes. Uh, Right now, I just had a hard time kind of figuring out when to take them as it says to take them on an empty stomach and that's to help with better absorption. So it's kind of tricky to plan Uh, when I'm going to eat (laughs) to get my food and take that pill like 15 minutes before. Um, But something you already may have in your kitchen that's also tied to serotonin is turmeric. And turmeric is a spice that has many health benefits as well, including fighting inflammation. And that's something that's pretty easy to add to meals. And obviously decreasing your intake of sugar, salt, caffeine, and alcohol is also advised, which is another thing like exercise that just seems good to do in for general well-being overall, or at least in moderation. I also wanted to mention something that one of my new Twitter followers, Yamaminums, shared with me. 
She told me about something called the Cycle Diet, which you can find at CycleDiet.com. I had not heard of it before, but after browsing through it for a few minutes, it's something I would definitely want to spend more time investigating. According to the homepage, the Cycle Diet was developed by a licensed dietitian named Deborah Hope Rydezel. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce her name. Rydezel, sorry for mispronouncing. Um, and it's based on the latest news in nutrition and medical research regarding reproductive health. There is a cycle diet workbook you can purchase on the site for $26 and a package of the workbook and a consultation for $75. And it also looked like you could get a PDF version of the workbook for only $15. And for those of you that are gluten free, uh, there is a plan available for you as well on the site. Now, it looked like you don't actually have to buy the workbook uh, to see the information. As I was clicking through their site, they do have a menu with the links to nutrition info and recipes for the different phases of your cycle. So if you're in your PMDD weeks, you can find those late luteal um, recipes and nutrition recommendations and also for when you're actually on your period as well. The website also points out several things you will learn with the workbook, including how to nourish your body according to which cycle phase you're in, um, why dairy foods may not be a good choice, which foods to avoid and include, and menu suggestions as well. I think if you were to prefer a non-medicinal approach to manage your symptoms, this would be a great place to start. So let's move on to serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. Um, per the Mayo Clinic, these are the most commonly prescribed medications to treat depression by increasing the serotonin levels. The reuptake part of the name means they block the reabsorption of serotonin in the brain, which then makes more serotonin available. There are a few different brands um, of SSRIs, but listed specifically for PMDD on the Harvard Medical website, and forgive me if I butchered the pronunciation of any of these because you know how medication names can be sometimes. Uh, these include Celexa, Prozac, Effexor, and Anaphrenil, and those are the ones sp uh, listed specifically for PMDD. I'm sure there are others available, and you would definitely need to talk to your doctor about which options would work best for you. Studies report that 60 to 90 percent of women with PMDD respond positively to SSRIs. Now, the journal article from the last episode didn't go into any detail about this, but they did write that fluvoxamine and bupropion should not be be first-line treatments for PMDD or PMS because they have not produced any positive results. In that article, they mentioned that in most of the double-blind randomized studies that were done about the effects of SSRIs, the inhibitors were administered continuously, but in other studies, the antidepressants were administered only during the late luteal phase when women would be experiencing the PMDD symptoms. So that would also be a conversation to have with your doctor, not only which antidepressant which would be helpful, but also when to take them. And like anything, there are possible side effects with SSRIs. The most common are headaches, sleep disturbances, nausea, and fatigue. But there are also other side effects like diarrhea, dizziness, blurred vision, and nervousness. Personally, I have no experience with SSRIs. I'm often hesitant to take any sort of medications, even things like Tylenol something sometimes. So something like an antidepressant I would be wary of, and not because it's you know it has a label being an antidepressant and you know I'm fearful of having a stigma or anything, but just the idea of something changing my chemistry like that is a little scary to me. Plus, the possible side effects alone are enough to turn me off. But if SSRIs work for some people and they work for you, that's great. You have to go with what works best for you and for your symptoms. So now let's talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, which has been found to help improve coping skills in managing PMDD and PMS discomforts. Now, I'm not even going to pretend like I knew what CBT was, so for the the first thing I did was Google the definition. And per Psychology Today, CBT is, in quote, 
a form of psychotherapy that focuses on solutions and encourages patients to challenge distorted thoughts, end quote. It aims to identify harmful thoughts and assess whether or not those thoughts are an accurate description of reality. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I do better with examples. So I did just that. I kept on Googling and I went searching for examples of CBT to better understand what it is and how it works. And I found nine CBT techniques, uh, which include journaling, unraveling cognitive distortions, cognitive restructuring, exposure and response prevention, interoceptive exposure, nightmare exposure and rescripting, play the script until the end, progressive muscle relaxation, and relaxed breathing. I still wanted to get a better idea of some, what some of these meant and found an example of uh, an exercise called fact or opinion. In this CBT exercise, there are statements which a patient needs to decide are, are fact or opinion. And these are statements like, I'm a bad person, I'm selfish, I failed a test. This exercise is supposed to help the person see that while we may have a lot of emotionally charged thoughts, that these thoughts are not always truths. And in recognizing the difference, it helps a person to challenge any harmful opinions that he or she may have about themselves. Now, this was one of the more simple examples, but there are other techniques that get a little deeper and take a little more time. Um, but the ultimate goal is to change our thought patterns and beliefs to help us face difficulties. And applying that to PMDD means that one can begin to recognize triggers for the emotional symptoms by learning new ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Now, I'm no psychologist, but to me, this sounds very similar like mindfulness. You're focusing on what's happening in your, around you and you're paying attention you know, to what you're doing, how you're feeling, and acknowledging those feelings rather than pushing them away. And wouldn't you know, after a little more Googling, I found there's another approach called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. From what I saw online, it looks like if you don't have easy access to a therapist, there are places on the web where you can do CBT online. I didn't really look into these and I don't know their efficacy or cost versus actually seeing someone in person, but it's something I will add to my list to further investigate. Now, another treatment or way of managing PMDD symptoms is a symptom-based therapy which targets a single symptom that is causing the most distress. So out of all the symptoms that PMDD brings with it, say the others are manageable, but anxiety is what's causing you the most issue. Then the tactic would be then to target that um, particular symptom, which would be anxiety, and not the other symptoms. Or say migraines are causing the most distress for you. Symptom management then would be targeted on migraines. And here's an interesting little side note that I learned from this section of reading. Uh, the medical term for breast tenderness is mastalgia. I don't know if that's new to you, but it's definitely new to me. Hormonal contraceptives are another form of treatment of PMDD. Um, from what I could find, Yaz is the only contraceptive that is FDA approved to treat PMDD. And this is because it combines an estrogen with a synthetic progesterone and is administered in a 24-4 uh, regimen that provides more stable hormone levels. And 24-4, meaning there are 24 active hormone pills and 4 inactive. Most oral contraceptives have 21 active pills and 7 inactive pills. Now, as a reminder, women with PMDD may have increased sensitivity to the hormone progesterone, which leads to more activity in the emotional center of the brain and possible higher levels of estrogen. Estrogen itself can also be a means of treatment for PMDD and can be administered with a skin patch or an implant under the skin. And this hormone is what inhibits ovulation. And this I do have experience with. I was on Yaz for maybe about a year or two shortly after my gynecologist had diagnosed me with PMDD. I remember it did help with the symptoms, both physically and emotionally. Um, I think more so emotionally. I remember one visit with my doctor where she asked me how I was doing and if I felt like the pill was helping. And my response was something to the effect of like, well, I don't feel like stabbing people anymore, so that's good. 
um, it def- I felt it, like it really helped get my rage under control. And um, the only problem I can remember having with Yaz was that I was having a lot of breakthrough bleeding pretty often between periods. It wasn't fun and it wasn't was for that reason that my doctor switched me off Yaz. But in hindsight, I wish she had kept me on it to see if maybe the breakthrough bleeding eventually stopped um, just because of how much I felt it helped with my PMDD moods. I think it might even be worth asking my doctor now um, to maybe give Yaz another try. If you go on the IAPMD website, you can find a page about hormones and PMDD. Uh, One I thought was really interesting is the follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, and by stopping the production of FSH using uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormones, it causes the body to be in a quote-unquote chemically-induced state of menopause. And with those words, like I just pictured my uterus and ovaries going into like this state of stasis or like stopped in time, like Han Solo in the Carbonite in Star Wars. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of a geek too. Did I forget to mention that? <laughs> um, one major step in the treatment of PMDD symptoms is surgery. Now, understandably, some women get tired of having to take medications every day, not to mention the continuous cost of those medications and maybe even the cost of therapy along with those medications. Women that are considering surgery as a last resort for treatment must have completed childbearing and be counseled carefully. The removal or of one or both of the ovaries, also known as an oophrectomy, would eliminate PMDD because it permanently stops the cycling of hormones. Um, but once the ovaries are removed, hormone replacement therapy would need to be started to protect the body from the symptoms of surgical menopause until a woman reaches the natural age of men- menopause. Uh, I've seen some stories online of uh, women choosing to have hysterectomies at at an age as young as 28 because no other treatments were effective. While I'm thankful that my PMDD is manageable, I sympathize and I'm sorry to those women whose PMDD is just that unbearable and that they have to make that huge kind of decision to have the surgery. All this might seem like a lot to process and even reading it to myself took a bit to get my head wrapped around things. I was using several resources to understand things and a dictionary for many of the medical terminology and words I was unfamiliar with. And um, you may have noticed I did not really touch on vitamins in this episode, uh, even though vitamins can be also seen as a form of treatment or management. And that's because I want to spend more time researching them and devoting a future episode to talk more about those. But the bottom line here is that there are several treatments available and some in combination with others to help treat PMDD symptoms. And it's just a matter of talking and making a plan with your doctor and finding what works for you and your body. And I would encourage you to be an advocate for yourself too. If your doctor doesn't mention a particular treatment, doesn't bring it up, ask about it. There's no harm in asking questions. I think the more questions you ask, the better. And this about wraps up episode number three. Um, I want to thank you for listening and sitting with me through this. Again, if you have questions or comments um, about the podcast in general, questions about myself personally, uh, thoughts about any of these treatments, please send me those messages through Twitter at PMDD Podcast. Or again, if you download the Anchor app, you can send me your questions or comments as voice recordings. Um, So thank you for listening and have a wonderful night or day wherever you are. And we'll talk again soon. Bye. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.